Sup Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, I am back today to go over a subject I definitely do not enjoy covering on this channel, and that is the subject of oral minoxidil for hair loss. Why do I hate covering this particular subject? Well, every time I do, I usually lose at least a few dozen subscribers and I end up having at least two new hate threads posted about me on Reddit. Oral minoxidil is the most holy of sacred cows in the hair loss community, even more sacred than microneedling. Criticism of the treatment is absolutely not tolerated, which is why I'm probably one of the only hair loss YouTubers who has ever spoken out against it. Let me make things perfectly clear though, chums. Literally, the only reason I do not share the same enthusiasm towards oral minoxidil as the rest of my brethren within the community is that I don't want the information I provide to hurt people. I am not telling anyone what they can or cannot do with their own body. That is their business and I am libertarian when it comes to the subject of drugs. If you choose to use oral minoxidil in spite of the limited safety data, then that is your choice and I don't hold that against you. I just don't want to have anything to do with it. I know most other hair loss YouTubers promote it and I do not resent them for doing that. I just personally don't feel comfortable promoting it myself. Now. I am not a huge YouTuber, but the views I get do number in the thousands, and if just one person were to be injured as a consequence of following my recommendations, then I would never be able to forgive myself. So my apprehension is out of concern for you guys. Even if you disagree with my stance on oral minoxidil, you shouldn't hate me for it because my cautious take is out of concern for your well-being, not my own. So the last time I covered oral minoxidil was in response to the shitty New York Times article hyping up the drug, which is no surprise since everybody knows the New York Times is one of the worst newspapers currently in publication. Ever since that last video, there hasn't really been much else to say about it. Nevertheless, on pretty much every video I post, including videos that have nothing to do with oral minoxidil, someone will try to pick a fight with me about it, and usually their criticism centers around the idea that the safety issues that I mention about oral minoxidil only pertain to large doses of oral minoxidil. They claim that all the dangers of oral minoxidil can be avoided by just taking a low dose of the drug, and they'll then bring up how all these dermatologists on YouTube, like Dr. Gary Linkov and the Hair Loss Show, promote it, and therefore I have to be wrong about this subject. They'll also claim that topical minoxidil is absorbed systemically, so it's basically the same thing as taking low dose oral minoxidil. There are several problems with these arguments, though. First of all, literally everybody has a different interpretation of what constitutes low dose dose oral minoxidil. The very first published research on low-dose oral minoxidil by Dr. Sinclair used a dose of just 0.25 milligrams daily, yet the most common dose I see people promote as being low-dose on hair loss forms is 2.5 milligrams daily, and oftentimes even 5 milligrams daily is mentioned as being a low dose. So. The dose of what most people consider to be low-dose oral minoxidil can be nearly 30 times higher than what was actually originally researched and recommended by Dr. Sinclair. And this dose is really not that far off from the 10 to 40 milligram per day minoxidil doses that are used to treat high blood pressure. Secondly, Minoxidil, when taken orally, even at a very low dose, will absorb much more quickly into the bloodstream than topical minoxidil. This will result in peak minoxidil blood levels that are much higher than the low blood levels of minoxidil seen with topical minoxidil. So, even though there is some systemic absorption of topical minoxidil, the minoxidil blood levels after taking it orally will have much higher peaks than when it is used topically due to the rapid absorption of oral minoxidil via the gastrointestinal tract. The fact is, though, we have decades decades of experience with topical minoxidil and has proven to be both safe and effective. It was actually developed to get around the toxic nature of oral minoxidil because back in the 1980s, oral minoxidil was only considered a last ditch treatment for hypertension when everything else has already failed. It was considered that because there was a high incidence of serious cardiovascular side effects from its usage. Therefore, its use as a hair loss treatment was considered obscure up until a few years ago. However, people have apparently forgotten how dangerous this drug was once considered, and so it is now being touted as a safe and effective treatment for hair loss even though we already have a safe and effective hair growth stimulant in the form of topical minoxidil, which was specifically developed to avoid the risk of oral minoxidil. The people who push low-dose oral minoxidil for hair loss, they like to claim that it is safe because of literature reviews like this one published in 2020, or because of this one also published in 2020, or because of this one published in 2021. All three of these articles looked at the studies that have been published on using low-dose oral minoxidil for treating hair loss. 
Each of them included between 9 and 17 studies, and as you can see in this spreadsheet I made up, there is considerable overlap in the studies that were included in these articles. Also, almost half the studies are written by or co-authored by Dr. Sinclair, meaning Dr. Sinclair's patients were probably reported on more than once in these studies, meaning there is probably some data that is being duplicated here. Two of the review articles included between 19,218 and 19,270 subjects, while the third article only included included 634 subjects. This huge difference in the number of subjects was due to the fact that two of the articles included a study from Japan that had 18,918 subjects, whereas the third paper did not include this Japanese study. The reason the study from Japan really shouldn't be included in a discussion of the effects of oral minoxidil is that oral minoxidil was only a small part of the treatment used in that study. There were 18,918 men in the study, but these men received not just 2.5 milligrams of oral minoxidil daily, but they also were given 5% topical minoxidil plus 1 milligram of finasteride daily, as well as a monthly injection into their scalp of lidocaine, minoxidil, arginine, aspartic acid, caffeine, copper tripeptide, lysine, niacine, panthenol, propendiol, propylene glycol, retinol palmitate, pyridoxine, sodium hyaluronate, and ubiquinone. So, they basically threw the entire kitchen sink at their hair. Another pro major problem with this Japanese study was that there was no control group, and also the results of the study were judged by patient self-assessment. So, there were no objective measurements like photodricograms that were done to actually measure exact hair counts in the study, which is pretty important since photographic self-assessment can be influenced by factors like lighting, angling, and hairstyling. Also, there is no indication of how frequently these subjects were seen in the clinic and whether electrocardiograms were performed on any of the subjects. So, this study was a bizarre combination of treatments with unclear methodology, so it is obviously not a valid assessment of oral minoxidil. In any case, these review articles all found a similar incidence of side effects, which is not surprising since they are mostly based on the same data. Let's take a look at the details from the review article that excluded the Japanese study and included only 634 subjects. The most frequent side effect from low-dose oral minoxidil was hypertrichosis, meaning the excess growth of unwanted body hair, and that occurred on average in 20% of subjects. Swelling or edema in the legs and low blood pressure occurred in about 2% of subjects. Abnormal electrocardiogram changes occurred in about 1% of the subjects, but this is misleading because electrocardiograms were not done in the majority of the subjects in these trials. Also, it is curious that there were way more women in these studies than men. One of the review articles examined the amount of bias as well as the quality of the studies done on low-dose oral minoxidil. They concluded that there is a high risk of bias in all the studies that were reviewed. The article concluded that, quote, there is insufficient evidence to support the use of oral minoxidil for alopecia and that, quote, data in this review are of very low quality, unquote. They also concluded that, quote, Oral minoxidil is related to various adverse events, and four of the nine included studies were funded by pharmaceutical companies. Therefore, currently, the available evidence to support the use of oral minoxidil in any type of alopecia is very low to low quality." Unquote. But even though the data is flawed, can we conclude from this research that serious cardiovascular side effects from low-dose oral minoxidil just don't happen? Well, there is strong evidence that these very dangerous cardiovascular side effects certainly happened in the past when oral minoxidil was used to treat high blood pressure. For example, in this review article from 2004, pericardial effusion was found in 3% of subjects. Now, let me be clear here, Jooms. Pericardial effusion is a very, very serious side effect. That is because a pericardial effusion is a buildup of fluid around the heart. This fluid buildup can compress the heart and interfere with its function, which is to pump blood. In the worst case scenario, a process called cardiac tamponade occurs where the heart can no longer pump blood. If the fluid is not immediately drained through surgery, the patient will quickly flatline and die. Besides fluid around the heart, in the same article, changes in electrocardiograms were seen in 90% of subjects when they first started on minoxidil. That's an 
extremely high percentage. So, 20 years after the dangers of oral minoxidil were first reported, the writers of the article felt that minoxidil was still too dangerous for routine use. The authors concluded their article by saying, quote, Thus, although minoxidil is a potent vasodilator and will lower blood pressure, there are significant problems that limit its use to resistant hypertension or patients with definite renal disease, unquote. So, Fast forwarding 20 more years into the present, you now hear the defenders of oral minoxidil look at this data and say things like, oh yeah, Kevin, well, this doesn't apply to low dose oral minoxidil for hair loss because they were using higher doses back then, so haha. -ha. They'll also make the point that many of the people getting oral minoxidil back then were older and some had kidney disease, and that kidney disease itself is known to also cause pericardial effusion. Well, first of all, like I said, some of the doses of supposed low-dose oral minoxidil being used approach the dose range used for high blood pressure. Also, pericardial effusion has been reported in people treated for high blood pressure with oral minoxidil who did not have kidney disease, so it has been clear for a very long time that the drug itself can cause pericardial effusion even in otherwise healthy people. You can go way back to the year 1981, and even back then, you can see that the drug was well known for its risk of causing pericardial effusion. In this article here, the author stated that, quote, 91 episodes of pericardial disease have been reported in 1,869 experimental subjects, 4.8% of them. Pericardial tamponade occurred in 21 with 8 associated deaths. There are no specific patient characteristics that predict the likelihood of effusion. Since the reaction is both idiosyncratic and potentially fatal, it seems appropriate to continue to limit the use of minoxidil, unquote. Just to clarify what this all means, an idiosyncratic reaction is a drug reaction that does not depend on the dose of the drug. So, if pericardial effusion is an idiosyncratic reaction to oral minoxidil, then it could potentially occur even at a low dose. Thus, the claim that these potentially lethal side effects can be avoided by just using a low dose of the drug is contradicted by the actual scientific research on the drug. It's also worth noting that a lot of the people who promote oral minoxidil are finasteride haters themselves who claim that oral minoxidil is a safe alternative. This is unbelievably hypocritical to me. Just think about this for a moment. These oral minoxidil fanatics believe 100% that post-finasteride syndrome is real even though this supposed condition just suddenly appeared about 10 to 15 years ago while it was never reported for decades before then when the drug was originally studied in the thousands of subjects. These very same believers in post-finasteride syndrome now believe that a side effect that was extremely well documented and recognized right after oral minoxidil was first used clinically is now a fake condition. They claim without any evidence that pericardial effusion and other life-threatening side effects can't occur with low-dose oral minoxidil. They say that these side effects have never been reported with low-dose oral minoxidil, and therefore the drug is completely safe, even though the safety data is based on a very small number of subjects. However... Given what we actually know about the risk of oral minoxidil, it seemed it was only a matter of time before someone got hurt, and guess what, Jooms? It's now officially happened. So here it is. This is a case report published last year. It is the case of a 40-year-old woman who started using oral minoxidil to treat a rare form of hair loss called frontal fibrosing alopecia. In addition to topical minoxidil and some other medications, she was started on a dose of oral minoxidil that is truly a low dose. We're talking just 0.2. 25 milligrams daily. However, after just three weeks of oral minoxidil, she developed edema all over her body, including her legs, arms, and face. The oral minoxidil was immediately stopped, and she was admitted to the hospital. On ultrasound testing, she was found to have fluid in her lung cavities called pleural effusions and fluid around her heart, which of course is the dreaded pericardial effusion that our forefathers, not to mention me, warned you all about as being a serious side effect of oral minoxidil over 40 years ago. So, she was treated in the hospital with a powerful intravenous diuretic, and after one week of being off low-dose oral minoxidil, her swelling resolved. One week later on her scans, there were no signs of any fluid around her heart or lungs, thank God. She has since stayed off oral minoxidil and has had no recurrence of symptoms in a year. So this case is no surprise because this patient suffered exactly the same kind of complications that was commonly seen with oral minoxidil when it was first frequently used decades ago. This one case report shows that potentially life-threatening pericardial effusion can occur even with a very low dose of oral minoxidil, which is no surprise because as we showed earlier, pericardial effusion is an idiosyncratic reaction to oral minoxidil, which means that taking a low dose will not prevent side effects. So, 
I'm sure right now some oral minoxidil fanboy is writing in the comments section, but given that's just one case, people are prescribing oral minoxidil like water nowadays. Surely the risk can't be that high. I mean, who are you to say you know better than the almighty Dr. Gary Linkup? How dare you? Well, I have a few things to say about that. First of all, we don't know the risks because there are no large prospective randomized trials on using low-dose oral minoxidil for hair loss. Like I said before, the data we have is very low-quality data. Secondly, we also don't know the risks because dermatologists are not doing electrocardiograms or echocardiograms to see if there are heart problems on oral minoxidil. I know this because dermatologists are not specialized in internal medicine or cardiology, and thus they are not trained to identify these problems. Problems. If you are not looking for a problem, you are obviously not going to find one. So, I am certain beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is underreporting of cardiac side effects from oral minoxidil going on right now as we speak. So, this case, it demolishes the lie that low dose oral minoxidil cannot cause pericardial effusions. This case is more evidence that pericardial effusions are an idiosyncratic response to oral minoxidil and are not dose related. Remember, this woman was just using 0.25 milligrams of oral minoxidil. The average dose I see people on Reddit say that's low dose oral minoxidil is either 2.5 milligrams or 5 milligrams of oral minoxidil. And you know, virtually none of these people are doing any cardiac monitoring because one of the most common types of posts I see on Reddit is people asking how to acquire oral minoxidil without a prescription. So forget about cardiac monitoring. Most people on oral minoxidil are bypassing their doctor altogether. Whether you have a doctor's prescription or not though, it has now been proven that you are not free of risk just because the dose of oral minoxidil you are using is low, as this case confirms, and let's face it, you guys who are on oral minoxidil are using way more than 0.25 milligrams daily. Oral minoxidil can cause the most life-threatening side effects even at 0.25 milligrams daily, which is far lower than what most people are advocating for, including dermatologists. Finally, I'd like to say that it would be one thing if oral minoxidil was the only drug we had available to treat hair loss. If it were a choice between going bald or risking these very serious side effects of oral minoxidil, then maybe I'd understand why people would want to take that risk. But that's not what is going on here. Nobody has to use oral minoxidil to save their hair. Topical minoxidil is perfectly effective and it has been shown to be a low risk treatment. Unlike with oral minoxidil, topical minoxidil has never been shown to cause pericardial effusion or any other life-threatening side effects, which is why it isn't just FDA approved for hair loss, it is even over the counter now. If you are tempted to use oral minoxidil because you are a non-responder to topical minoxidil, then there are ways to get around that. One way is to use higher dose topical minoxidil like 10 and 15% minoxidil, and I have a video about that which I'll link below. Another way to turn yourself into a responder is to combine 5% minoxidil with the compound tretinoin, since tretinoin has been shown to upregulate the sulfotransferase enzyme, which converts minoxidil into its active form, minoxidil sulfate. I also have a video about that which again is linked below. Beyond that though, we have far more effective and safer drugs than oral minoxidil at our disposal when it comes to treating androgenic alopecia, such as the 5AR blockers, finasteride, and dutasteride. There is literally no scenario that exists where anyone is in a situation where they have to choose between oral minoxidil or their hair. So I really don't know why people get so emotionally attached to oral minoxidil. I'm not telling you guys to just shave it, bro. I'm just telling you there is no reason to resort to dangerous drugs like oral minoxidil minoxidil when these superior and safer alternatives exist for you. It is also likely that within the next year or two, we will have other superior alternatives like pyrolutamide and GT20029, which will further render oral minoxidil completely irrelevant. So, if you want to take oral minoxidil despite the risk, then that is completely up to you, and I don't judge you for that. But please, do not bury your head in the sand and deny that these serious risks exist. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I know it is absolutely inevitable at this point that I'm going to get personally attacked for creating this video, and the hate does get to me sometimes, admittedly, especially since most of the hate comes from within the hair loss community, which is a community I am trying to help. But I nevertheless thought that this news on oral minoxidil was far too important not to share. Again though, this is just my advice, take it or leave it, no hard feelings if you don't find what I say convincing. The only reason I am talking about these dangers is because nobody else on the internet will. But 
Hopefully this video, as well as my other videos on oral minoxidil, which are all linked below, will help you make a more informed decision about how to treat your hair loss. So, I'll see you all next time, my fellow hair loss witchers. God bless.